Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, neurologist from Andhra Pradesh, India. I am also the medical author of the book Focused Neurology. Today we are going to discuss a very very important topic, the clinical clues of cerebellar disorders. The clinical clues of cerebellar disorders. We know that a person has got a cerebellar disorder. If there is a cerebellar disorder, what are the clinical clues by which we can make that this could be the cause of the cerebellar involvement? So the clinical clues of the cerebellar disorders. Basically, a person with cerebellar disorder will have cerebellar manifestations one of the prominent manifestations being ataxia, imbalance. For a person to have a good balance, three systems are very much essential. One, the ocular. So if there is any disturbance of ocular functioning, persons will have imbalance. Second is the vestibulocerebellar connections, especially the vestibulum, which is very important for balance. And third is the posterior column, the large fibers. So if these three systems function in unison, then only persons will have good balance. If there is a mismatch of these three systems, persons will have imbalance and ataxia. If of these three systems, only one system is dysfunctional, the other system can compensate, the other two systems can compensate and person's imbalance will be slightly reduced. But of these three, if two systems get affected, persons will have severe ataxia. The classic example is Romberg's sign seen in persons with posterior column lesions. When a person's posterior column is affected, still, as long as he is able to see, person will not have ataxia because ocular and vestibular cerebellum are functioning well two systems of the three systems are functioning well and therefore persons will not have ataxia but we remove the second system also by asking the person to close the eyes now only one system is functioning and therefore the person will have severe ataxia imbalance which we call it as Romberg's cell so posterior column ataxia will get worsened if we remove the visual cues also. So of the three systems, if they function in unison, they will have perfect balance. If one system is affected, the other two systems to some extent can compensate and the imbalance will be slight. But if two of the three systems get affected, persons will have severe ataxia, severe imbalance. So imbalance is one of the important findings by which a person with cerebellar disorder presents. There could be other cerebellar manifestations also like nystagmus, dysdiadecokinesia, hypotonia, pendular nature. So a person has got cerebellar disorder and we have almost clinically confirmed that the person because of cerebellar manifestations is having cerebellar disorder. Now what are all the clinical clues by which we can make the etiological diagnosis of cerebellar disorders? So if we go step by step, we'll perhaps make a clinical diagnosis, etiological diagnosis of cerebellar disorders even at the bedside. So first, a person comes with cerebellar disorder, we should always ask history of drug intake, especially from the neurologist point of view, phenytoin. We give phenytoin for epilepsy. Phenytoin is an anti-epileptic drug. We give it for seizures and epilepsy. But due to some miscommunication or a person's over responsiveness, there could be phenytoin toxicity or too much of phenytoin being given and excessive phenytoin doses at toxic level can affect cerebellum and can cause cerebellar involvement. So the drug history, especially phenytoin is very, very important because phenytoin is one of the common causes. Phenytoin toxicity is one of the common causes of cerebellar involvement. The second, what we commonly see is the alcoholism. Persons drink a lot. 
alcohol is very much toxic to the cerebellum on a long standing basis alcohol can affect the cerebellum to a great extent and can cause alcoholic cerebellar degeneration and therefore we should always ask history of alcoholism person not only has alcoholism which deprives him of essential nutrients like vitamin b1 he might not be even taking his food well which results in severe vitamin e deficiency so vitamin e is one of the important factors for effective functioning of cerebellum so when there's a vitamin e deficiency persons will have cerebellar involvement so malnutrition especially vitamin e deficiency can cause cerebellar disorder a person is all right suddenly he develops cerebellar manifestations and suddenly he becomes unconscious sudden onset of impairment of consciousness or loss of consciousness with cerebellar manifestations we should always suspect a vascular etiology stroke cerebellar stroke the cerebellum is basically supplied by three vessels posterior inferior cerebellar artery a branch of vertebral artery anterior inferior cerebellar artery a branch of basilar artery and then the superior cerebellar artery which is also branch of the basilar artery so if there is a sudden embolus or a sudden vascular impairment affecting any of these three vessels can cause a massive cerebellar infarct a stroke or even cerebellar hemorrhage hypertension can cause cerebellar hemorrhage and persons will have cerebellar signs with impairment of consciousness which is of sudden in onset so persons having impairment of consciousness very suddenly and develop cerebellar signs of sudden onset we should always consider cerebellar stroke persons having a cerebellar manifestations and on examination if he has fever we have to suspect infectious etiology cerebellar symptoms plus fever we should always suspect infectious infectious etiology especially viral cerebellitis viral cerebellitis is very common virus infections tend to have affect the cerebellum it has got a proclivity for cerebellum and therefore a person having cerebellar disorders with fever we should always suspect viral cerebellitis the others being cerebellar abscess and it could be other infections vomiting generally when we have a feeling of feeling to vomit we have a preceding nausea we have nausea we feel like vomiting vomiting and then we vomit so nausea and then vomiting but persons with raised intracranial pressure any posterior fossa lesions space occupying lesions they can go and impinge the vestibular nucleus directly and persons would vomit without the preceding nausea this is known as projectile vomiting so a person having cerebellar signs with vomiting we should always think of the posterior fossa mass and a space occupied lesion person with cerebellar signs has got loss of memory dementia which is almost uh, which is almost uh, present in say few months it develops over a period of few months cerebellar signs with development of dementia being uh, taking place in a matter of few months always suspect crutz felt jacob disease cjd is one of a very devastating disorders because they usually are fatal and the life span also gets dramatically reduced and they only survive for few months or perhaps few years so a person having cerebellar signs with loss of memory and especially involuntary movements like myoclonus we should always suspect cjd a prior disease persons having cerebellar findings and visual impairment pain on eye movement pain ocular pain we should suspect optic neuritis and optic neuritis and cerebellar involvement we should always think of multiple sclerosis multiple sclerosis is a demyelinating disorder of the central nervous system it affects the well myelinated tracks 
therefore it affects the posterior column pyramidal tract and cerebellar pathways the second nerve eighth nerve these are all well myelinated tracts it hardly affects spinal thalamic tract because it is least myelinated so persons having a well myelinated tract involvement like optic nerve and cerebellar pathways we should suspect a demyelinating disease like multiple sclerosis if person has got along with cerebellar signs of thalmoplegia an impairment of eye movement disorder we should suspect a variant of gulen barre syndrome known as miller fisher syndrome where they have ataxia areflexia and ophthalmoplegia the ophthalmoplegia is because of the excessive of gq1 receptors and therefore these persons have gq1 antibodies which selectively affect the eye muscles and therefore miller fisher variant miller fisher syndrome a variant of gbs will have cerebellar signs along with ophthalmoplegia so ophthalmoplegia plus cerebellar signs we should suspect miller fisher syndrome and also wernicke's encephalopathy alcoholics or hyperemesis gravidorum in pregnant ladies because of excessive vomiting they may have vitamin b1 deficiency vitamin b1 deficiency also causes ophthalmoplegia and ataxia as i said multiple sclerosis multiple sclerosis affects the large fibers including the the second cranial nerve cerebellum and mlf medial longitudinal fasciculus which connects third fourth and sixth nerves so when the multiple sclerosis affects the mlf medial longitudinal fasciculus the connection between 3 4 6 nerves are not coordinated and they can have ophthalmoplegia especially the adduction gets affected if there is multiple sclerosis bilateral adduction can get affected which we call it as ino internuclear ophthalmoplegia if a person has got extra pyramidal signs extra pyramidal signs along with the cerebellar involvement we should suspect wilson's disease a disorder of copper metabolism and olivo ponto cerebellar disorder if the person has got on examination has got decreased deep tendon reflexes decreased deep tendon reflexes and cerebellar signs we should suspect hypothyroidism even in the miller fisher syndrome or gulen barre syndrome variant they have ataxia a reflexia and ophthalmoplegia so a reflexia and cerebellar involvement we should suspect either hypothyroidism or miller fisher syndrome a gbs variant if a person has got downbeat nystagmus downbeat nystagmus we should suspect lesions around the foramen magnum one of the important causes of foramen magnum lesion a developmental disorder causing downbeat nystagmus is arnold chiari malformation so we should always suspect development disorder especially foramen magnum lesions like arnold chiari malformation in a person with cerebellar disorders and downbeat nystagmus if a person has got involuntary movement especially myoclonus a sudden jerk with dementia cerebellar involvement suspect prion disease crutzfeldt jakob disease and when we look at the eye if a person's congenital vessels are prominent especially in children with severe ataxia prominence of congenital vessels we should suspect ataxia telangiectasia ataxia telangiectasia in a person with telangiectatic vessel that is dilated congenital vessels very well prominent in persons who are having this a uh, disorder if a person has got spinal and foot deformities spinal deformities because of the para unequal weakness of the para vertebral muscles muscles causing scoliosis unequal weakness of foot muscles causing high arched foot if we find these kind of deformities spinal deformities foot deformities in a person who's having a long standing disorder should suspect cerebellar involvement a person having cerebellar involvement we should suspect a long standing disorder like hereditary neuropathy so we should always ask family history also here because family history spinal high arch foot and then cerebellar involvement the diagnosis will be fredrick's ataxia the family history is also helpful in other spino cerebellar degeneration many of the auto autosomal recessive disorders 
if a person has got jaundice, KF ring, obviously hepatolenticular degeneration, liver involvement, we should suspect Wilson's disease. A person is losing weight, is having respiratory symptoms in the form of cough, chest pain and is losing weight. We should always suspect a small lung cancer giving rise to paraneoplastic cerebellar degeneration. Small cell carcinoma produces lot of antibodies and destroys the cerebellum known as the paraneoplastic cerebellar degeneration. So a person comes with cerebellar disorder, we have to run through all these clinical clues to diagnose the cause of the cerebellar disorder and arrive at the etiological diagnosis of the cerebellar disorder. So if we go systematically analyze, we will be able to diagnose the cause of the cerebellar impairment at the bedside. I hope you have enjoyed listening to my lecture. If you have any suggestions or comments, kindly post on to my YouTube channel. But please like and subscribe my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page, Dr. Srinivas Concepts. Thank you. Bye.